I'm going to briefly introduce Professor Manuela Cayani. Professor Cayani's uh, curriculum and, and uh, you know work is it's very difficult to dig into. Just to study the the, work, the curriculum of Professor Cayani, you would take, it would take a day or two. And so I just made a selection a selection of uh, issues from from her outstanding career. She is an associate professor in political science at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Florence. She holds a BA and PhD uh, degree from Florence University, which is a separate university from Scuola Normale Superiore. And she was also Marie Curie at uh, Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid from 2011 to 2013. After that, she was a postdoc, actually before that, she was a postdoc at the European University Institute from 2005 to 2009. And then uh, she was associated uh, faculty, and she is uh, currently associated faculty at the Institute for Advanced Studies, IHS, in Vienna. She uh, is uh, affiliated with COSMOS, the Center for Social Movement Studies at the Scuola Normale Superiore and co-director of the International Observatory on Social Cohesion and Inclusion. She, uh, research interests range between social movement and Europeanization, far-right politics, both at the level of movements and parties, extreme extremism online, right-wing and left-wing populism, uh, movement parties, qualitative methods of social research, <coughs> uh, and other many other issues, uh, topics. She has been the leading person, so the principal investigator of a number of projects. I selected four. Uh, just, uh, actually, those that are still ongoing, and, and two of them that just finished. So, um, Outleap, Neo Authoritarianism in Europe, and the Liberal. Democratic Response is a Horizon Europe project that started in 2022 and uh, Professor Kayani is the principal investigator of that. Then uh, Democratic Challenges, Social Sustainability and Gender Inequalities um, that started in 2022 until, and will run until next year. And she finished in 2022 Talking liberal narratives and Euroscepticism from below. Uh, that was funded by the Europe for Citizen program. She was also PI, and this is the last project I mentioned, uh, of the project Tackling Illiberal Narratives and Euroscepticism uh, from Below. Sorry. This is this is a double Okay, among her publication there are several books. <laughs> And uh, just to, to, to make sure that we are on the same page when we think of who Professor Cayani is, then she published with Oxford University Press, Hashgate, Palgrave, Rutledge, among her books, it's for coming or maybe just out, uh, the one with Enrico Padovan? Yes, so a very funny book which is about populism and pop music. So it is a book in which we try to bridge uh, cultural studies and political science. So we had a view on populism, not from a, a classical mainstream political science perspective, like explaining populism and the recent success of populism for, from structural factors like economic crisis, political crisis. But we have tried to understand the symbolic reasons why populism has been so easy, so successful. And so we went uh, studying, in particular, the link between populism and popular new pop music uh, intended as uh, pop culture, pop music, but not only pop music, but pop, popular culture, mm? which is of course concretized in many countries in pop music. So it has been a bit of an adventure also for me, and this book is uh, already available. I'm very sorry that it's also very expensive, because unfortunately when we publish books with uh, publishers, uh, English one especially, they are super expensive, and therefore the chance I have uh, that my book is um, is bought is are very low actually because they like a 20 not 90 euros but i hope that in few years there will be also the paperback yeah, editions and I also if you are interested please just write to me an email and they will send you the pdf so 
can say that. <laughs> <laughs> if not, no, no, nobody from Palgrave is uh, listening to this uh, speech. I will send you the letter later okay. on. Uh, let me just, I know, I know you don't like to hear your CV so many times because it's, uh, but I will just try to be brief now. There are, I had selected uh, five books. I'm not going to talk of all of them. You can actually access her. Uh, CV online, but I want to cite only the one on social movements and Europeization from Oxford University Press with Donatella de la Porta, which is also the most cited uh, work of Manuela Cagliari. And among her articles, you will see, I'm not going to spend time on this, but she has published with the most relevant, renowned, and uh, highest quality journals uh, in Europe and, 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 and beyond. Uh, about uh, political science and uh, political sociologies, which are the two uh, main areas of research of uh, Professor Kayani. So, thank you very much for being thank here. Thank you. And for okay. Thank you a lot. Thank you also for this very kind introduction. And I hope to match the expectations now, that now very high uh, after this introduction. So, uh, as a, um, Professor Gianola said, mainly I come from social movement studies. I want to give you just a bit of a bit, um, background. Social movement studies. So in political science, uh, I come from a perspective uh, which conceptualizes uh, also politics from, from one election to another. Mm? So what do people do from one election to another? And usually people participate politically through protest, uh, movements. And so when I started my career, where I was a PhD student together with De La Porta, I was focusing on the, on the usual social movements uh, that at that time we were used to focus on, the left wing progressive ones. But then I moved toward the other pole and I started to focus on the regressive conservative side of uh, social movement arena, which is actually, to be honest, an arena on which still there were, now is increasingly, uh, very few research. Mm? Because usually social movement scholars like to focus more on, on the left wing uh, progressive side. So when I started to, 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 to focus on, on the radical right, uh, it was a, also a sort of big, a bit a bit of provocation when we and Donatella, me and Donatella della Porta. Because we, what we started to do uh, was also so, somehow to shake uh, the uh, mainstream uh, political science approach to the radical right that was, especially at that time, mainly focused on elections and political parties. And so we said, okay, beyond and, and before uh, and within the political parties on the radical right and, and voters of, of the radical right, there are also movements, social movements on the radical right. So let's try to approach them uh, with analytical tools, uh, with the theories, with the hypotheses that we have developed, actually, um, to investigate the other side of the coin, the left wing progressive ones. And this is also linked to my main tools of analysis. I mainly work with qualitative tools of analysis, which means uh, ethnographic research, interviews, focus groups, uh, frame analysis, much more than on statistical data. Um, and this is something I'm going to also to present to you today. Mm? Um, today I have been, uh, we, ha we have selected together with Cristiano this uh, Zoom, which is on eight speeches and the radical right, especially in times of pandemic, which is the one recent uh, research I have done. Uh, but in general, more in general, if we have time, I don't know, I know that we have only one hour in total, but I will go forth and back. Huh? I put together uh, a number quite a high number of slides. So what I would like to address with you, it, it is not only the, the um, eight speeches and the radical right on social media, but more generally, more broadly, I would like to um, address with you the idea, the topic of uh, the radical right mobilization on the internet, hmm? broadly speaking. So what I would like to, quite quickly, to, to go through <coughs> together with you today is, um, Radical right, radical right uh, organizations, including political parties and, 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 and social movements, and networks on the web. Mm? So I want to more or less to address the, the topic of the formation of cyber communities online. Then we will focus on the, the very topic of today, which is radical right and hate speeches, in particular on the social media, which is a very hot topic. Because as you probably might know, social media are Mm, considered conducive for radicalization, polarization of the political discourse. And the radical right, on the other hand, is considered one 
uh, champion of uh, uh, eight speeches online. Huh? And so in this uh, research, what I have, uh, have tried to do is to combine and operationalize and to measure empirically uh, these, uh, these uh, hypotheses. So is it true that the radical right in particular is a producer of eight speeches online? Let's see. In particular, I framed this little research because, as you will see, it is just one, 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 one year thank you, of, what, of research. I have focused this research within a, a peculiar time frame and peculiar framework, which is the critical juncture of the pandemic. Mm? Because another hypothesis that uh, circulates among the scholars is that uh, critical juncture, external crisis, actually mm, offer, can offer uh, uh, opportunities, political and cultural opportunities to empower different types of actors. And so the idea is uh, probably the pandemic also did offer some more opportunities to the radical right to spread eight speeches online. Mm? And then third, uh, very quickly, on fake news, which is another version of eight speeches. Uh, again, I will um, show you a, a research, an empirical research on the radical right and fake news on the web, mainly based on the UK case. Mm? But let's uh, start from the, the, the beginning. So, the, the main part of uh, the speech will be um, focusing on exploring the relations between radical right organizations uh, and aid speeches in time of the COVID crisis. Why? Because uh, we say that we can see, we can also argue that uh, it is in moment of crisis that solidarity is uh, all the more important, but also it is in moment of crisis that solidarity is contested. Mm? Uh, it is also important to, to say that neither aid speech nor radicalization are new phenomena, even before the COVID, <laughs> even before the internet, uh, um, these phenomena were there. Mm? However, their manifestation and consequences also, so the power of aid speeches to influence also the opinions of people. So the consequences have, of course, changed greatly over the past few decades, mainly because of the increasing role of the internet mm? in our society, so also for political information, for the political activation of people. And uh, if we want to uh, zoom on, on a definition of aid speech, because it is quite intuitive, not what is an aid speech, hate speech is a speech inciting hate. But how can we define it? Because when we do social research, we want to measure, we want to assess some empirical evidences of what we investigate. Uh, and the first important premise, uh, which is something we have to be aware of as social scientists, is that actually currently there is not a common consensus among legislations, across legislations, uh, neither within Europe, but even worse uh, between Europe and, for instance, the US, of what does uh, constitute a hate speech. Mm? So also the legislation on hate speeches is a bit fragmented, is, um, is uh, not uniform. Mm? So for instance, uh, just to give you an example, in Germany, uh, for hate speech, uh, we mean mainly hate crimes mm? and legally punishable misinformation. Mm? Uh, but there are various other definitions. Just to give you another example, in uh, the United States, uh, uh, since 2009, hate speech was used as a very general term for eight field expressions intended to put down and denigrate individuals and groups of people uh, covering right-wing extremism, racism, anti-Semitism, and other forms of group-related uh, um, attack on the web. But as you can see also here, it is a very ambiguous definition. Mm? Uh, on the other hand, we have the institutions, no? which try to define but on the other hand, we have the independent actors like Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, which also try to provide some rules no? mm, for their practices, uh, some rules for identifying aid speeches on their platform and in case uh, to block them. And they provide another definition different than uh, usually the institution. So as you can see, um, uh, it is very difficult also to, to, to research empirically something which is sort of moving target. Uh, and so in this research, uh, for instance, uh, Facebook, uh, in its community standards, define, defines hate speeches as a direct attack 
on a person due to protected characteristics like ethnic background, national origin, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, caste, gender, gender identity, handicap or illness. Hmm? And also here you see another uh, potential um, um, tricky point. Huh? Uh, who is uh, entitled to define what is hate speech in a society? So also here we see clearly a, ve a very important normative problems. Hmm? Because how can we define the boundaries of what is allowed and what is not allowed in democracies? Here you see the two important actors do define it. On the one hand they are private, on the other hand there are the institutions. Uh, by the way, to do this research, we focused, we started from the, since we are in Europe, from the European Commission definition. And the public incitement to violence um, or hatred directed to groups of individuals on the basis of certain characteristics, uh, including race, color, religion, national or ethnic uh, origin. So this is the definition that we try to operationalize. So when we saw something similar to that uh, on social media, for us, it was a signal of, okay, we are in presence of an age speech. But things are not so easy in empirical research. Um, then we will move to the empirical research, but again, a, a bit of background. Hmm? Why we talk about, in particular, we talk about the internet and age speeches. Hmm? Already 15 years ago, some American uh, thinkers, in particular, here I quote an American social psychologist, speculated on, on the why there is so much hate on the web. So why on the internet we can find polarization, hate speeches. And he concluded that it was because mainly two, two characteristics. On the one hand, anonymity. On the other hand, the absence of moderating influences. Hmm? Think about the traditional media. In this case, you would have the moderation of the journal, at least, and is. Uh, positioning in society. No? It can be a right-wing journal, a left-wing, and so on, so independent. So, usually according to the Amer American sociologists thinking about this nexus, mainly the, uh, the configuration that was uh, uh, the answer why internet and hate speeches, uh, the configuration the very conducive for that was what is called online disinhibition. So, not only do participants in virtual bubbles and or countercultures uh, reinforce their very often extremist views on the web, but also they spur each other on. So basically what has been proved, also for what concerns radical rights of the communities, is that they are uh, communities um, characterized by what is called inbound social capital, in-group theory. So in which uh, uh, you reinforce uh, talking each other a peculiar um, vision of the reality, but also you legitimate this vision on the basis of a collective identity, you know, which, is, which is also um, created and reinforced through these uh, uh, reflections, uh, which, however, circulate always in a sort of battle. Hmm? And also here I could say, I can add that this also very clear to all of us that uh, there are also some technicalities uh, of the social media which uh, favor this creation of bubble. Indeed, another concept which is used very often is um, fil filtered bubble. No? It means that usually when we go basically on the social media, on the internet, uh, because of algorithm, we are likely to be exposed to what we like more. Mm? It can be sport, uh, uh, ta food taste, but it can also be political opinions. Mm? So it is a sort of uh, uh, circular issues, I would say, um, process, uh, which is uh, by default the opposite of what uh, we have in liberal democracies, which is pluralism, pluralism, pluralism of preferences, mm? a minority and a majority, which, however, debate and live together, no? which is, this is the principle of any uh, democratic system. And again, if we look now, what I'm going to show you is, of course, they are all sentences, but imagine that behind each of them uh, there is a, a, um, a school of studies. Uh, so what, what has been proved so far with empirical research um, is that, on the one hand, the internet, but in particular social media, much more than websites or blogs or other arenas, um, are, are important, crucial factors, or at least catalysts, 
for radicalization processes of any type, but not just on the radical right, also on the radical left, on the religious extremists. This has been proved. Hmm? The internet is a very favorable arena, especially for right-wing aid and extremist groups, much more than for moderate, hmm? mm, for the expression of their claims. Why? Because there are filter bubbles, because the internet looks like uh, um, favoring a sort of tri trivialization of the political debate. Also, again, for, for very simple technicalities, in a tweet you have a, 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 a restricted amount of space to express your view. It is not deliberation. Mm? It is also al almost the opposite of the deliberation arena uh, planned by Abermans. Mm? Social media has been also seen with empirical research to have a significant impact on racism and diffusion. Hmm? Right-wing populism, on the other hand, uh, here it is why I try to support and reinforce uh, this uh, idea that there is a nexus particularly strict no, between the radical right and the uh, hate speeches. Uh, right-wing populism, if we look at the several definitions <coughs> that we have at disposal, uh, one definition of populism is a form of communication style hmm? uh, that can trigger political and social polarization with negative effects on pluralism and minorities. Uh, and therefore, in, in particular, populism has been, for its, uh, its uh, um, thinking, which is Manichaean, no? uh, zero one in Europe out group. So populism has been particularly linked with uh, the delegitimization of political adversaries and their opinions. Huh? This is uh, one of the definitions we usually give uh, to populism, hmm? and in particular right in populism. Social media also play a key role in spreading political discourses, especially those produced by right-wing populists. Hmm? Why? Because right-wing populists, uh, also for their typical style uh, of doing politics, which is low, huh? in, a, in the dichotomy low versus high, so populists by default are close to the people and close to the, to the also the style of uh, um, argumentation that you can also find uh, in, uh, in uh, let me say, law arenas uh, without any um, negative judgment. But it, we have been, it has been, a, it has been found that actually uh, the, the, the social media and, and the internet are particularly um, fitting hmm, with the populist style of also for this uh, idea of finding easy solutions for complex matters, which is another definition of populism. Mm? Uh, also, uh, it has been uh, noticed that uh, the internet provides a sort of fragmented media ecology, no? as I said, very uh, many islands. Uh, they, uh, this media ecology very often by bypass both the institutions on the one hand and traditional journal, newspapers and some traditional media. And finally, it has been noticed, and this is also uh, the, 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 the topic of one book I published some years ago in 2012, that uh, the internet offers a powerful tool for right-wing groups for what? Reaching followers, so recruitment, connecting with like-minded group, like groups, so <coughs> collective identity spreading, mm? uh, and for diffusion of their ideology. Mm? Particularly, we also have to notice that social media enables <coughs> ordinary citizens to actively participate in the political public sphere on the, social, on the virtual market. Mm -hmm. okay, then. Although all these uh, you know, connections are quite uh, common sense, uh, intuitive, uh, still the debate about the nexus between the, the extreme right uh, and, and speeches uh, is a bit normative, uh, abstract, uh, uh, there are still few empirical data. Mm? And also, in particular, comparative research is, uh, um, is still uh, few, mm? moderate. And for comparative research, uh, I mean research in which you see you and investigate more than one country, more than one party of the same family, in order to generalize what you find, which is something we have tried to do, hmm? on, although we worked only on two cases. Now I, I put in pause, uh, I suspend uh, just for a few minutes this idea of hate speeches in the social media, and I want uh, to uh, make a step back, uh, focusing on what? before. The content. I would like to focus on the networks. 
mm? because of course uh, radical right groups, uh, yeah, they can be considered a producer of eight uh, speeches on the web, but let's see also the, the, the kind of networks and the communities, the cyber communities that they are able to create on the web. Mm? And therefore, I'm going to present to you, and why I say networks, because networks means uh, creating a community, mm? like uh, a face-to-face -face community that we, have, uh, we can create in other occasions, like our mm, social role at the university, or family, or friends, or uh, uh, the internet is also very uh, an ally for radical right groups uh, in uh, worldwide, I would say, to create uh, Mm? Network, uh, networks of cyber communities, also going beyond the national borders, very often. And so here, I will show you a, a few data uh, that I have uh, collected, uh, looking in particular at the Internet for Radical Right Organizations, uh, both political parties and movements, uh, and the use of the Internet, uh, in particular websites, for the identity formation, organizational contact, and for mobilization. This is a research based on websites, as I said, not social media. So it's a research uh, uh, already a bit old, huh? because uh, some, someone could also argue that websites today are not the, uh, the more likely arena, huh? where you can see the political activation of any group. But it's important also, just focusing on websites, we can see many interesting um, things. Uh, this research was based on seven countries, um, six Europeans and the US, and uh, was based <coughs> on uh, any kind of extreme right groups uh, with a presence online, so with a website, any kind of. Any kind means from political parties to political <coughs> movement to cultural association, sports and uh, music, extreme right groups, uh, skinheads, uh, any kind of. Hmm? This is the, the, the plan. Hmm? So as you can see, there were countries, there were also different types of extreme rights, and uh, what we wanted to know is, uh, as I said, the use of the internet, in particular the website, for fulfilling several uh, political activism functions. No? In particular, if you want, operationalize and disarticulate, we look at that. the use of websites for political communication, for political information, for spreading propaganda, for nurturing a virtual debate, but also for mobilization and recruitment, for national and transnational contact. And if you want to have a look briefly at the methods that we used, uh, basically what we did at the beginning was to uh, make a, what I call a uh, dark web list. So we try to find uh, in each of these seven countries each single extreme right website. So we, we, we map mm, all the websites uh, pertaining to a, an extreme right group which were present. And they were, at the end of the day, more or less between 100 and 105, uh, 150, excuse me, extreme right uh, groups uh, with uh, their websites in each of the six uh, European countries and more than 1,000 extreme right websites uh, in the US. Mm? Uh, then after a selection, uh, we focused on six, uh, 650 organizations of the web, of the, um, excuse me, on, on the radical right. And in order to trace uh, their linkages, we focused on only, only the web links uh, in the pages of my partners, my friends. So we gave a, a quite strict definition <coughs> of a link between uh, organizations, not just hyperlink. So it was not enough that one extreme right organization, imagine uh, Meloni, Fratelli d'Italia today, had one document in the, in, the, in the website quoting another party, like Vox in Spain. No. In order for us to codify, yes, there is a link, um, it was necessary that in the web page of uh, uh, group number uh, one, um, there was a dedicated page um, identifying 
my partners, my friends, and therefore identifying other organizations of the radical right under this strict form. So it was a proxy, it wanted to be a proxy of a sort of social relation, or at least a close ideological um, closeness. Mm? So it was a definition of the link, a bit more stronger than it could be today, like one I like uh, no? uh, in Facebook or, or simple a tweet and retweet. Because it was a sort of major commitment. So this was the, 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 basic, the, 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 the basis of the, the empirical data collection. And we tried to, we tried to count, uh, codify, so at, at the end of the day we constructed our metrics uh, in each country in which uh, for each of these 150 organizations you could also have uh, all the other partners, national and international, together with which they are related. <coughs> and we elaborated all these methods with what is called social network analysis hmm? in order to reach these nice graphs. And what we did discover, hmm? so you can see here, we discovered first of all the, that there were actually several virtual communities of the radical right, hmm. but also so very well connected inside uh, within them. So you can see that each of these communities are quite densely connected. Mm? So the red uh, circles are radical right organizations, and uh, the, 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 um, the, the link are, as I said, the presence of a, a linkage to another organization identified as my partner. Mm? You can see that some of these seven communities were very densely connected, others were a bit more loose. This is the US, this was the Spanish one, and uh, in terms of uh, a typology, a classification, what are these red uh, circles? More or less, just to give you an overview of the different types of uh, actors within these communities, we found that more or less in all of our countries uh, we could find uh, some typical extreme right groups, political parties, political movements, neo-Nazi groups, but also nostalgic, revisionist, so the negationist, hmm? but also cultural right-wing association, like New Age, but also Catholic ultra-traditionalist, but also e-commerce, so commercial uh, websites in which military are sent. Hmm? But also then the sphere of use of cultural groups, skinheads, music and sport, as I said. So what we could infer from these uh, graphs, hmm? Using measures of, of social network analysis, uh, aiming at uh, measuring the density of each community, uh, the potential cleavages, the distances between organizations. So now I don't, I don't insist on the measures, but believe me that what I see is not just uh, impressionistic, but it is based on also numbers. We discovered that, yes, in all our seven countries, the website, the website, so the internet in this case under the form of websites, is used uh, um, abundantly to establish networks within the country. But the shapes mm, of these uh, seven communities differ quite a lot from one, cant one country to another. And using some uh, social, um, social um, movement uh, either types of networks, uh, we uh, uh, we um, saw that uh, the German extreme right, uh, but this was true also for the French one, uh, um, the, the seven community of the extreme right uh, in Germany and Fran France uh, um, is uh, very close to what is called a star structure. So a star structure in the language of social network analysis is a structure according to which there are very few there are few central actors, few central extreme right organizations able to um, monopolize all the exchanges in the network. So very powerful. They are central, mm, according to several measures. It means that for any other actors who want to connect uh, to each other, they have to pass uh, through these organizations. So they also have a, a strong power in terms of uh, brokerage. Mm. This kind of uh, shape uh, um, also poses some challenges for the for the um, for the policy makers, let's say, no? because uh, 
if you want to, uh, they are densely connected. Therefore, even if you um, eliminate, in principle, one red circle in the center, there, in, there, there is another one which is able, however, to connect uh, the overall community. This shape has, uh, therefore, consequences, also in terms of potential for mobilization. Usually, in social movement studies, it is said, uh, sector of movements which are organized according to a star structure are sector of movement, it can be, they can be environmentalist movement, peace movement, which are, uh, in, within which it is uh, very, uh, very probable that a collective identity, a strong collective identity emerges and that mobilization <coughs> is, uh, um, is uh, more likely. Mm? Uh, on the other hand, we had the structure of the radical right on the web, uh, more characteristic of Italy and England. This structure in social network analysis language is called polycephalous. As the word says, polycephalous means more than one head. Mm? So what we found actually was that the community of the radical right online in, in England and in Italy was a community already with potential for cleavages within, uh, fragmentation. So there were small heads, mm? uh, small, let me say, local heroes able to monopolize their uh, little community, but not very well connected to each other. Mm? Indeed, now I, I don't have the poster to pray, but uh, if uh, in, in such a, a shape, uh, if you, it is enough to eliminate just uh, three, four red circles, that the overall, um, um, overall shape, the overall unity of the network disappears, and you have more than one community. Within this shape, usually, the communication is uh, more complex. Mm? Uh, so there are sort of uh, several collective identities or sub-identities uh, living together within one sector, which is, in this case, the radical right. We also discovered other, other uh, shapes, like the one of the US, that we called uh, decentralized. In this, uh, uh, in this community of the radical right, as you can see, there are also many isolated nodes. It means that uh, there are also um, organizations that are not linked to any other. Mm? So in this community, it is also hard uh, to talk about uh, a sector. Mm? Uh, so what can such a shape tell us? Mm, for, for sure, this shape uh, uh, can give us two ideas. On the one hand, perhaps uh, weakness of the radical right in, in US. So a decentralized structure can be indicator of weakness, extremely strong weakness, but it can also be indicator of a peculiar form of uh, action and resistance, an uh, so-called uh, lonely wolf uh, uh, political activism. So in this, com in this <coughs> shape, uh, it is also very probable that one <coughs> political action um, does emerge, it is very radical. Mm? Because there is not sort of uh, sector uh, guiding, no, or at least giving the guidelines uh, mm, for the uh, action strategies in, in that country. Mm? Indeed, it is not by chance that US, in particular, also for right wing extremism, are characterized by uh, very violent explosion, which also very often implies uh, uh, death. No? So there are uh, uh, in, in incidents which are very uh, violent and, and also often um, made by more than by one organization behind by individuals with radicalized by themselves through the web mm? exactly using extreme right websites extreme right social media so they they they, uh, they are politici politicized let's say by themselves without any strong connection to the rest of the movement and or affiliation to an organization. But what do, uh, what is the, 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 also before, what is the, the, the international side of that? So do websites only serve the purpose to unite internally these communities? No, no, no. They also are used to create uh, an international cyber community. Uh, when we calculated the number of international and cross-national ties that each of these extreme right organizations were <coughs> sending abroad, we found that more or less one third of the group, so one third of these 650 groups that we analyzed, have international linkages. 
So they are linked to other extreme right groups in Europe and or uh, US or, or, or other regions of the world. So one third. Then if you want also to disarticulate these uh, uh, numbers, it's also interesting to see that the more internationally oriented types of extreme right organizations are the neo-Nazi groups. And uh, one country in which the radical right is particularly open, or, um, Europeanized or internationalized is Italy. Political parties of the radical right, uh, also surprisingly, are not the most uh, internationally oriented ones. And I say surprisingly because, uh, as you know, of course, at least the political parties, at least in Europe, have uh, also an arena, no? I have the European Parliament in which they could, could group and could, but evidently they are a bit cognitively uh, less uh, uh, or internationally oriented than other types of extreme right groups. Mm? But what is the content? What is the content that do, does circulate through these uh, networks and so uh, also via, uh, via uh, websites. Here we, through a content analysis, mm, which is another technique of uh, uh, investigation, so through a content analysis based on each one of these single uh, 650 websites, we try to look at what, do, what did they do most and, 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 uh, and on several political uh, functions. Mm? several political uh, um, um, different forms of political activation through the web. And we saw from, from this uh, in a some, uh, summary way that especially the websites and therefore these networks are particularly used for the spreading of ideology and propaganda and for communication and political information <coughs> while for globalization and other functions you see that uh, the internet is not not yet so strongly used, mm? but for communication, yes. Mm? And this also introduces us uh, to our next step, which is uh, eight speeches. And here, I, just for a descriptive mm, matter, I can focus uh, one minute on more uh, some uh, percentages which, which pertain uh, internet information propaganda, uh, internet and communication. For instance, we found that uh, uh, most of the websites of the radical right offer to the users a large range of information, which is also political education. So articles, paper, and dossiers, uh, no? 60%, half of them have a news section huh? in which they make reference to media coverage. But of course, uh, it's a selective media coverage huh? on we, on, uh, uh, where only some topics and some Mm, frames are uh, underlined more than others. Mm? Uh, there is also a strong attention on the communication with the public, so there is also a sort of desire to be reached, which also could be quite impressive and not surprising uh, for such type of organizations, which also uh, very often uh, work between the legal and the illegal. However, we found in their websites a, a stronger desire to be reached. Now they also gave, gave uh, uh, to their user, potential user, information about the office, uh, so the, also the physical location of the organization. Hmm? There is, there is in, on these websites also stronger propaganda toward insiders, so a strong propaganda meant to reinforce those, the, 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 the collective identity of the group, so to, to, to reinforce the communication um, toward those who are already sympathizers. For instance, 50% of these websites contain hate symbols, such as swastikas, burning crosses, um, symbols going back to the fascist or Nazi past. And most of them are also quite appealing, so they are not just symbols put there, but they are also dynamic. And also, uh, we discovered that one goal of propaganda for sure is recruitment. Indeed, <laughs> most of these organizations, 50%, had in, on their websites multimedia materials, like uh, also ring phones uh, mm, with uh, political content, uh, and uh, audio, music, and videos, uh, for instance, the use of cartoon for the spreading of propaganda. So as you see, here we are already moving toward uh, the, other, uh, the other topic of our speech. Uh, which is eight speech. So eight speech on the social media can be contextualized <coughs> to better understood probably against the background of what I have illustrated until now. So 
the extreme right is online. Um, also, just on their websites, uh, even if they have uh, currently many more arenas like uh, social media, but even if we just stop at the websites, the internet provides uh, the extreme right organizations uh, with an important tool for political communication and also political mobilization. Mm? And to go to this hate speech in particular, uh, I want to say also that this is a, a, a work in progress project and therefore uh, so far I only presented to you the analysis which have been done on uh, Twitter, which is one social media, so not Facebook, not all the other like Instagram. Uh, so there, is a many thing, there are many things to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, uh, I only focused on here on two countries, UK and Italy, and only on one year, so the first year of the pandemic. Why UK and Italy? Because they were the two European countries most hit by the pandemic in terms of death and so on and so forth, the first year. So in principle, if we want to make a, a linkage between pandemic, critical juncture, aid speeches and the radical right, these two countries are two crucial cases, no? because they, the, in the first year of the pandemic at least, they were the cases most shocked, let's say, by the pandemic, and therefore in which the political and cultural and discursive opportunities for eventually spreading hate speeches and polarizing discourses on the web was more probable. Hmm? We analyzed uh, about 21,000 tweets of what, and here also the, the, the focus change changes a bit uh, um, than the previous research I illustrated. Here we focalized only on the main political parties, only on the main radical right political parties in Italy and in UK. And in, and in particular the political parties and the <coughs> leaders, uh, hmm? because you know uh, they can also have a Twitter account uh, um, different than the account of the respective party. And therefore, we downloaded all the tweets of, uh, I'm very sorry for that, I didn't wrote uh, here the parties. Okay. Let me write here the, the cases, because it is always important to, to know what are the cases of one specific research in order to understand the findings. And therefore, in Italy, for the two main radical right political parties, we focus on the Liga, and uh, Fratelli d'Italia, currently in government, at the time no. Mm -hmm. And of course, their respected leaders, so uh, Salvini and Meloni, Giorgia Meloni, their respective Twitter account. And for UK, we focus on the UKIP and Nigel Farage, mm? the leader. And these are our two cases. So these are 21, more or less, 21 and some hundred tweets were coming from these parties and these leaders only in 2020. 2020 okay? So we downloaded all, all of them and we wanted to do what? You know that our main goal was to understand the presence but also the forms of aid speeches. But we started by looking at, first of all, uh, the um, let me say conceptual maps. Mm? So, what are the conceptual maps which are sold by these actors in time of pandemic, the first year? So, what are the conceptual maps? It means, uh, more concretely, what are the main recurring words, concepts, uh, group of concepts, uh, ideas, clusters of concepts, mm? storytelling somehow, not stories, narratives. And uh, in order to understand that, what we did was uh, what is, mm, uh, uh, we applied a technique which is called uh, uh, word clouds. Mm -hmm. It means simply a technique that analyzes the content in terms of the more, the most recurrent uh, words. And uh, it visualizes, as you can see here in these figures, the most recurrent uh, um, words um, according to their size. So the biggest size indicate here the uh, most recurring words in, in the tweets. Mm? And therefore, according to word cloud, you can also uh, interpret this cloud 
according to circles, no? circles of the cluster of the most recurring words. The second circle can be understood as the cluster of the second most recurring words. And so each cluster somehow tells us a story, mm? because each cluster is made by not only recurring words, but words which recur together mm? in a relation. And uh, what we could uh, understand from this uh, word cloud, and of course uh, these are pictures, but then behind there were uh, percentages and numbers and so on. So, on. so we, we saw that in Italy, the main conceptual map, let's say, of the radical right during the first year of the pandemic uh, is made of uh, four main clusters. Mm -hmm. The first one is the antagonistic relationship between the government and the Italians. No, not the radical right, the Italians. So somehow the radical right was uh, um, assuming implicitly sort of the voice of the Italians no? in this uh, constant uh, um, uh, frame which was put forward in tweets. So on the one hand there are the poor Italians, on the other hand is the government which is against the Italians. The second cluster, mm, the second main recurring frame is uh, uh, the cluster of the radical right versus all the other parties, mm? the mainstreams, on the right and the left. So the radical right is uh, somehow presenting, descripting themselves uh, as the, some, some sort of the savior of the country no? against this situation of the Italians on the one hand and the government on the other. Then on the third cluster we found the many important categories to be defended. And these categories actually were many of them framed in terms of Italians, so in, in, let me say in ethno-nationalistic terms. They, sometimes we also found the word citizen, no? which is the more juridical uh, uh, frame to refer to uh, people. But uh, the, the other times um, uh, were describing the category to be defended in terms of families, uh, mm? so with a sort of conservative values approach, families and the workers, uh, mm? which is uh, uh, also the socioeconomic cleavage that uh, the radical right is increasingly adopted together with the cultural one, also the socioeconomic, so we are also the defenders of the workers, not just the Mm, Italian peoples against the immigrants, no? culturally speaking. And then Italy, Italians, Italy, Italian friends. Uh, paradoxically, what we found, uh, and what we, was very interesting also on the light of the other uh, results, was that uh, the um, typical frame of the radical right, which is an immigration, anti-immigration, the radical right ideology, so the core value, values of the anti-immigration anti nation, was not so strongly insisted through Twitter. Mm? So it, it, it looked like, uh, mm, at least during the pandemic, uh, the radical right uh, somehow did abandon the typical uh, rhetoric. No? In, mm, however, mm, using other frames in which this rhetoric of anti-immigrants, uh, nationalists, was present anyway. But not in such, a, in such an explicit way, hmm? as you can see from the first two clusters. Um, in order to sort of make a comparison, because of course you can say here, okay, you have uh, told us uh, what about the radical right, but is this different, this conceptual map, uh, than the maps uh, that the other mainstream parties on the right or on the left were providing? on social media, yes, it was different. If you see, indeed, because we did this word cloud and Twitter analysis also for the others part, like the Democratic Party, and, uh, and, uh, and actually we saw a completely different political discourse mm, sold uh, on, on the web, in social media. Very often mainstream parties were, uh, um, had as first main cluster, Italians revered under cover, the Italian revered. No? Here you see there is immediately an antagonistic cluster. Here there is a, a, a constructive cluster. So it is important to focus on the Italian rebirth uh, under COVID. Second, <coughs> actions. Actions toward affected categories, but actions. Not just description and redefinitions of categories to be defended. Um, uh, then, categories to be defended. And uh, what we noticed was also a different uh, language, a silent rhetoric, joyful, hope language, uh, uh, prognostic phrase, much more than a dramatization language that we found uh, um, above. 
Now I don't continue work with the uh, results on the UK and I move directly to the eight speeches present. Uh, another technique that then we applied was this uh, topic modeling, which is a technique of content analysis meant to understand what are the main important topics hmm, which are mobilized in a certain text, in this case, uh, this 21 tunnel. And uh, topic modeling is a quite sophisticated technique because it counts a topic uh, not necessarily, uh, not in a strict way, let's say, but in order to form a topic, uh, topic modeling, uh, try to pick up here and there hmm, words. Hmm, so it's a very sophisticated technique. Uh, not, uh, not like a content analysis working with dictionaries. Mm? Somehow with uh, topic modeling, uh, you find um, in a more nuanced way what are all the topics, because you don't need necessarily that the word of a, pertain of a specific topic is mentioned. But you, this technique also works uh, with overlapping topics, and then they try to count what, is the, what are the most important ones, and basically we found uh, 14 main topics uh, around which the radical right leaders and parties in the social media communication uh, structured their political discourse during the pandemic and for Italy these were the, the, the topics immigration, covid, national proud, criticism toward the government, self-promotion, personal event and common Italian events. Okay. Focusing only on the covid topics, so each time one leader of the radical right, or one part of the radical right was tweeting one tweet concerning COVID. Let's see if there is an hate speech inside. And what we found was this picture. So imagine, among all the communication, we only focused on the COVID communication because, again, we wanted to see if this COVID, this critical juncture, this uh, um, cra critical event uh, was pushing toward more polarization. And we found that it can look like they are mm, low percentages, but they are not so low if you think about the definition of hate speech, mm, drawing on the definition of the commission. Almost 20% of the tweets that radical right, uh, the main radical right parties in Italy were made when talking about the COVID were containing an hate speech. So an attack against a minorities, whatever we can define it, either uh, by race, nation, gender, or handicap. Or, mm, so 20% uh, <coughs> of, the, of the tweets referring to the COVID were framing the COVID in terms of what? Allies, responsibilities, solutions, problems. 20% were framing this situation, including an hate speech. So an attribution of responsibility or an attribution of uh, um, an enemy category against some minorities. Mm? The situation was a bit, uh, so the, the presence of uh, um, hate speeches was lower, as you can see in UK. And if you want also to disarticulate this 17%, we see that Giorgio Meloni and E.R. Farty um, had a, a higher production of eight speeches uh, and Matteo Salvini a bit lower. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, now I stop here because there is no time. We also went uh, more in depth in this analysis, trying to understand okay, but in this 20%, what are the main outgroups? Uh, no? And we found that the main outgroups are similarly in England and UK and Italy, they are the immigrants, but also the supranational institutions and actors. When we look at the, for the type of issues, so when there are these eight speeches, but around which, which issues are constructed, we found that similarly in UK and Italy, they were constructed around the mainly the immigration issues, again, talking about COVID, eh? and, uh, but also politics and political life in general. In fact, what we found especially in Italy, what was we called political bullism. Not only eight speeches, but political bullism, which is mainly the use of eight speech to attack political enemies, which can be, in this case, not just the left, but also unions uh, and um, left -wing movements. Uh, um, so this political bullism um, 
I want to say. Again, in terms of the method, it's important. We have been also a bit uh, sophisticated in our codification of hate speech because we did uh, attribute number one, so full hate speech, when there was really an incitement of, uh, for, to violence against uh, some minorities. But we also uh, attributed 0.5 when there was not a, a, an explicit incitement to violence, but there was anyway an attack. Mm -hmm. mm? And uh, it is exactly these, uh, these attacks that we found, especially uh, against uh, mm, the political adversaries that we, that we characterize as political bullies. So this is to say that uh, in these uh, around 17% uh, of aid speeches in Italy, there is a portion of aid speeches which is directed toward the usual suspect, so immigrants, immigration, um, nation, nationalism, no? in, a in a speculative way. Uh, speculative way. But, uh, interestingly, uh, part of these aid speeches were directed toward political enemies, no? according to what we call the political bullism, which is a category that you can also find in sociology currently. So um, the direct attack, which try to delegitimize uh, the enemies, uh, political enemies and their proposals. Uh, and therefore this political bullism uh, is particularly conducive exactly for this polarization of the, of the debate, no? in which personal attack uh, are much more frequent than uh, political uh, uh, reflections on, on the content of the, of the politics, okay? And so this was particularly interesting for us. I stop here and I, I also would invite you to interpret this, uh, what we found in Italy, uh, according to what we can interpret this, according to what in social movement studies is called uh, discursive opportunities. Hmm? So what are the in a country the discursive opportunities? for raising some issues or for mobilizing some uh, topics. And in our view, this climate, let's say, uh, did uh, construct uh, uh, discursive opportunities for polarization of the political debate, for attribution of responsibilities that uh, could also be conducive for uh, um, more radical activism offline. Mm? So I, I, I concluded here, but it is not by chance that also in Italy also the Novak's protest at one point took a peculiar radicalization um, uh, path, let's say. So discursive opportunities usually are understood in social movement studies as the opportunities that in a society you have in a certain moment to make some ideas more legitimate than others. Mm? Uh, so for instance, the salience of climate change uh, uh, problems uh, today uh, constitute a, a discursive opportunity which is present more or less in all the country. So currently mobilizing for environment is not considered so strange uh, no? as it could be, for instance, I don't know, um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago in Italy. Because there are some, uh, there is a, a dominant discourse uh, which already includes this uh, awareness of, uh, uh, for instance, climate change, need protection and so on and so forth. But the discursive opportunities in a country can be made of several things. So the saliencies of issues uh, can uh, pertain to several different issues. Okay, so this is what we wanted to understand. Uh, if from, from now we are going to uh, also try to understand this better <coughs> in terms of generalization, focusing also in other countries, focusing on different uh, social media, in order not to be biased by the tools of analysis and by the countries that we analyzed. Thank you, Robert. Talk to the...